Helene is often dissatisfied with herself and with her fate. While breathing comes naturally to her, it is sometimes an unimaginably tough task for her. When her lungs stiffen, she feels like a woman, stranded in the middle of the ocean, swallowed by waves, grasping for a single inhale, while other people, like seagulls gallop in the air. In the opening scene, Matthew, her husband, wakes her up. Helene would give everything to stay in bed, but Matthew wants her to come to a social gathering so much that he's ready to prepare her all by himself. So, after a few seconds of urging and resisting, Helene yields and lets him start with her makeup. She doesn't want to go, but for now, she decides to go with it. We arrive in a loud living room in the next scene, where Matthew's friends are gathered. Everything is going great so far. For a moment, Helene might even feel as if she's being regarded normally at last. Two other friends join the party then, Audrey and Mady. They greet Helene with special love and appreciation. Later, the hosts and the newcomers are alone in the kitchen, discussing Audrey's pregnancy, and sharing delectable emotions when Helene walks in. Instantly, the room gets quiet and gloomy. Helene asks where Ice is. The moment is extremely awkward, as everybody except her tries to come up with something to say. It is clear that they didn't want Helene to know about the pregnancy. It is also clear that, for some reason, people start acting differently when she's around. One of the friends then asks her if she's still working at her firm, and Helene answers that she's quit working not long ago. The conversation is dull and dry. That evening, thanks to a single unnerving insight, we understood what stood behind this pattern of behavior from the friends. While having dinner, Audrey says no to having some wine due to her pregnancy, but to hide it from Helene, she says that she's behind the wall tonight. Helene has absorbed far more pity than she wants to handle at this point. And so, she confronts this terribly humiliating attitude from the friend group. Now we learn that she's quarreling with a terminal lung condition, and her case is so severe that not only can she not have babies, but she finds it impossible to work too. And this behavior from Matthew's friends is incomparably insulting. She's not bad news or a moving gloom, she wants other people to act normally around her. After this confrontation, naturally, there is no way that she can remain by the table, so she stands up and leaves the party. A while later, Matthew comes out after her and aids her in breathing. Like an old couple, they walk down the quiet street as Matthew attempts to justify her friend's actions. Unfortunately, he doesn't seem to understand how Helene feels, but clearly, he is trying his best to support her. To find someone who understands, she turns to the internet, looking for people for whom demise isn't so distant. Her mother calls her. She begins asking questions about her health immediately, so Helene has to change the course of the conversation. They talk for about a minute, and even though their subject is light, Helene's mother still ends up with tears. When the call is over, Helene feels as hopeless as ever. What can you do when your passing seems inevitable? There is no one in Helene's life to whom she can ask this question. And so, she turns to the internet once more. The first thing that comes up is a blog filled with artificial motivational pathos. Not helpful at all. But at the end of the Google page, she finds a site called Mr.com. The page is called When You Know You Are Expiring. It catches Helene's attention. She doesn't need to be told what to do or what to feel. She just wants to see that there's somebody else on this planet who understands what she's going through. And this site provides her with just that. There is no text there, only pictures and drawings, but they resonate with her on some strange level. At night, she finds a picture of some beautiful, peaceful setting, and for a moment, she feels as if there is nothing she would like more than to be there. Helene and Matthew hear good news in the doctor's office the next day. Helene is eligible for a double lung transplant. All that is left at this point is to remain patient until the perfect fit is found. Then the surgery can be done, however, promises cannot be made. Still, 50% of the patients who undergo this surgery end up totally healed after three years. Therefore, there is a good chance of success. This must be good news for the couple, but Helene doesn't seem so happy at all. A short time later, she is looking in the mirror of a door, behind which a man is taken care of. She wanted to see this man today, but the doctor said that he was too exhausted from the operation he underwent 10 days ago. All in all, we do not know yet why this man is her, but it's clear that he's an important figure in Helene's life. She was told that she could talk to him tomorrow. In the next scene, she sees a picture of Mr. taken seconds before some surgery, and decides to send him a letter. After a short opening, she wishes for him to come out of whatever is done to him, healthy and better. She says this solely for selfish reasons, of course, she would miss his posts. Later that day, she is going through some old pictures when she hears her laptop in the other room. Mr. wrote back, and his letter is funny and witty. From his letter, Helene learns that he's in remission. Matthew comes home then, and she closes the laptop quickly. The couple prepare food and talk for a while about the picture Helene found earlier that day. Warm memories start flooding the table, but Matthew can't help but notice that his partner isn't eating. He decides to ask what is wrong and gets the anticipated answer. It seems that it is about the man Helene saw the other day at the hospital. It seems that we might get a little bit more insight into who that man was, but the conversation is quickly derailed when Matthew incites her and expresses his frustration with her attitude. 
He elaborates on how they finally have a chance, a real reason to be more positive. But in his eyes, she always finds a way to wallow in everything that is wrong with her life. Helene, on the other hand, feels unheard and alone in her distress. Silence falls over the table then, until Matthew decides to share something that he thinks will lighten the occasion. He talked to his boss, and now he can spend only three days a week in his office and all the other ones at home with Helene. Naturally, he thinks spending more time would automatically improve their communication and relationship, but Helene thinks it's futile. She knows that space is all she needs, and finally, quietly while averting her eyes, she tells Matthew that she wants to be alone for a while. Matthew leaves home immediately. He tries to dance away his ruminating thoughts at night. Then, a friend meets him outside of the club. Strangely, Matthew has a lot in common with this person, whose partner is constantly traveling abroad. At first, Matthew shares his most distressing thought, a thought that often comes to him when he feels down and exhausted, which is he might be better alone. But he quickly rejects this thought and admits that even though his partner is here physically, she feels extremely distant. He needs these terrible thoughts to be validated. And so, all he can do is share them with someone who will understand. Meanwhile, Helene and Mr. are on a video call for the first time. After talking about ordinary things, they started getting to know each other a little bit better. Helene begins talking about her condition and the hardship that came with it. She always thought that she would have constantly craved support and warmth from her friends and family, but she gradually realized that she preferred not to talk about it at all. Just like Matthew did with his friend, she shares her most distressing thought with Mr., a person who would understand. And then he says something that strums the deepest string of Helene's heart. He says that the living cannot understand those who are soon to perish. After these words are spoken, Helene quickly agrees, but gradually finds it harder and harder to breathe. After a few seconds, she is forced to leave the call to find her oxygen concentrator. They resume their conversation then, and a bond is set between two people on the edge of life. Finally, Mr. tells her about the place in Norway where he resides. Encompassed by the wonderful scenery, this place of beauty and peace is a perfect example of the most boring paradise. We get back to Matthew now, who approaches the door with his drunken wiggly feet. Once he gets into the apartment, the conflict that exploded earlier that day disappears, and the two embrace each other firmly. At the end of the day, once all their sorrows are expressed and accepted, they can be free from them and, finally, share the love and appreciation they have for one another. In their struggling, weakening relationship, this is a moment where everything gets back to normal, when the connection between them is rekindled. It is true that this night of passion and heat still ends in Helene's coughing and frustration, but both can say that they finally see each other and feel each other's presence after a long time of being distant. They spent the evening of the next day at a concert. Unquestionable love and intimacy emanate from their every motion. But suddenly, when the lights change to deep blue, Helene's expressions change dramatically, and we understand that a radical decision has just been seated in her mind. The next morning proves to be extremely tough for the couple. Matthew is about to go to work when Helene holds his hand and pulls him back. She has something very important to say, a decision to reveal, and there is no way Matthew will like it. Helene wants to travel to Norway. At first, Matthew tries to come up with a plan to go with her. Most likely, his boss will let him take some time off from work, but Helene wants to go alone. Matthew's expressions change dramatically, and it is clear that the couple is about to engage in a lengthy, tiring argument. Matthew does everything to somehow make her reconsider, to make her see the absurdity of her decision, but Helene has stronger arguments. She needs this trip, and even though she's sick, she's allowed to give it a try. In this city, she's swallowed by the patterns of behavior and the relationships that are taking her nowhere. She just waits here, and she needs to distance herself from everything to reconnect with herself. And she can only be successful in this endeavor if she does it alone. And so, there is nothing Matthew can say that will make her reconsider. In the end, the man yields and puts his hand over his brows, trying to cover up his tears of distress. The trip proves to be surprisingly easy and beautiful for Helene. She texts Matthew constantly and lets herself be mesmerized by the incredible scenery and solitude. She arrives at her destination on a ferry boat and gets greeted by the author of the blog, who doesn't look like the pictures at all. He introduces himself as Bent and helps Helene with her luggage. Ben is a silver-haired, old man with a face covered in wrinkles and clever, all-penetrating eyes. In the next scene, while the two are driving to the settlement like two close friends, Helene can't help but ask him about his appearance. He answers that the picture of the man on his blog was depicting his friend, not him. He leads her to her hut near the lake that used to be a boathouse once, then gives her a little more detail about the way of life there and then leaves her to herself. The hut seems empty and cold. There is no way of knowing for sure what Helene is feeling as she walks slowly around the tiny place. She takes her phone then and records a message for Matthew. She says that she misses him. This is the only thing she feels right now, sadness from missing the lover. She is unable to send this message, however, there is no reception in this place at all. That night, Helene realizes that sleep is almost impossible here. The silence and the light make the atmosphere almost insufferable. The voices of the birds and the sound of splashing water seem too high to tolerate in the ever-encompassing and cold peace of this island. The next morning, sleepless Helene walks up to the house to have breakfast with Bent. 
The latter looks and sounds like a man who takes and endures all his suffering in grace. He agrees with Helene that the silence sounds differently here, and that the sunlight doesn't feel as wormy on the skin as in any other country. He informs Helene about the phone service then. It seems like there is only one ancient cable in the settlement and one phone in his own office. If she wants Wi-Fi, however, there's a place nearby called the Reception Hill. She can hike there on her own to use her phone. In the next scene, Helene does just that. It proves to be quite an easy hike. A lot of people are gathered on the top of the hill to use their phones. Helene finds a good spot and calls Matthew with a face that emanates nothing but delight. Matthew, however, enters the call with a devastated face. Within the first few minutes of the call, Helene has explained to him why she couldn't call. But in the end, Matthew still isn't satisfied. He's extremely anxious. He feels like his wife is in danger, and if something happens, he won't be able to do anything in order to help. He feels restless and powerless, but he doesn't express those feelings properly. Eventually, Helene manages to change the subject successfully and directs her attention to the beauty of the place. In the next scene, back home, Bent finally asks Helene about her condition. She says that she has idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, an unexplainable, unstudied chronic disease. For an unknown reason, her lungs stiffen gradually. And this process will continue until eventually breathing becomes impossible for her. The only thing that might save her is a transplant. Throughout the course of this day, Helene tries to familiarize herself more with this place, very briefly, she even swims in the lake, but there is still something she cannot cope with, light. She hasn't slept well for a very long time. It is 1 a.m. when she stands up, exits her hut, and enters Ben's house. Shortly after, the host comes down and talks quietly about the unbearable light for a while, until Helene asks him about the model house he made. It seems like Bent is often extremely vulnerable to boredom. And this small cardboard house is one of the many products of this trait of his. As Helene gives him some advice about how to improve the design of the building, we learn that she used to be an architect back in the day, and it is clear that she loved her job dearly. Ben offers her to sleep in his bedroom, and Helene agrees happily. The bed in the hut is terrible, and the windows there have no blinds. Five hours into her sleep, Bent enters his room to grab his stuff. He plans to sleep in the hut for a while. The sound of his movement wakes Helene up, and when she learns about Bent's idea, she urges him against it. He should sleep in his own bed. She'll just lay down for a bit more and make no sound whatsoever. Ben is a little reluctant, but he still agrees and slowly approaches the bed to sleep on the very edge. The next morning, Helene goes to town and calls Matthew from there. She wants to be fully honest with him, but to avoid Matthew's possible bad reaction, she tells him that she met an old man in a supermarket who had a family hotel. Since her old hotel had unbearable conditions, she took this opportunity, and now stays at his house. Afterwards, Helene returns to the settlement and decides to go for a long walk. She hikes quite far in delightful weather, but suddenly, her condition manifests, reminding herself of her fragility. Uncontrollably, she starts coughing, and while gasping for air, she begins to black out. Soon, she runs out of energy to fight, and the colorful atmosphere sinks into black. By some miracle, however, she still manages to get back. With Bent's help, she struggles her way to the couch, where she finds her oxygen concentrator and finally draws a decent breath. Bent seems concerned. He thinks calling a doctor might be a good idea, but Helene says that there is no need. This was her last walk, and that is all. Bent simply answers that there is no way of knowing for sure whether it was or wasn't, and then goes about his day quickly and quietly. Both know that they understand one another in this, there is no reason to have a pointless conversation where a bunch of words are thrown around carelessly. There's only one thing that Helene wants to express to him, and that is the feeling of relief that comes with giving up on life. Later that day, a woman visits Bent. It is quite an unusual occasion. Bent scarcely has any visitors, after a short while passes, Helene asks him about it. However, Bent is reluctant to answer. It is clear that he doesn't want to talk about it. He avoids answering quite harshly, but afterwards still gives Helene the entire story. This woman was just one of the townsfolk, and she invited him to a memorial service for a man who was once his best friend. They worked together as engineers for a long time until a terrible accident happened. There was an explosion and Bent had to save himself by swimming out of their working site before flames swallowed him whole. He swam quite far, until he came across the body of his best friend, floating on the surface. For him, the explosion ended up being fatal. Since then, people's demise became a constant part of Bent's life. He doesn't need memorial services to remind him of their existence, therefore, he has no intention to accept the invitation and go. Later that day, after going to the memorial service herself, Helene sits on a ridge overlooking mesmerizing scenery. Somehow, by some invisible mechanism, a realization comes to her that she doesn't want a transplant. Here, she feels present in her body, aware of this beautiful moment. She feels alive and happy in her own body and in her own mind. Perhaps for the first time, dry past and dreadful future disappear, and all that exists is this wonderful moment. A teardrop rolls over her cheek, and she makes her decision. And so, now comes the toughest part of conveying this decision to Matthew. She calls him from Bent's office and slowly, bit by bit, tries to explain her decision to him. She wants to choose the way she leaves this world. Matthew doesn't understand it, of course, and neither does he approve of any of it. 
So, he says that he's coming to get her, and he hangs up the phone. Throughout the rest of the day, however, she gets approval from Bent. From his point of view, she doesn't owe anybody a certain kind of end. She is the one who will experience it, and so she must be the one choosing the way she wants to go. While sitting on a bench in town, Bent also tells her about his family. It seems like he couldn't leave this place. Taking a step out of this village was impossible to him, while his wife couldn't cope with this atmosphere and the memories it was associated with any longer. So, they got separated, and Bent stayed to live here alone. In the next scene, Matthew is already here, and the couple is jumping in the freezing cold water. Afterwards, while lying down together in the hut, Matthew tries to start a conversation about the lung transplant. But Helene interrupts him and postpones discussing this harsh topic for the future. Later that day, she and Bent are preparing lunch while Matthew waits for them at the dining table. His eyes are closely observing Helene's every movement and all of the signs of intimacy, an understanding between her and Bent. He sees a new life that his wife started without him, and it hurts to just sit here in silence and watch. And so, without any special ceremony, he simply stands up and leaves. Bent understands that Matthew's going through a lot. So, he proposes that he leave the house for a while until the couple sorts of things out. Helene rejects this offer, of course. Why should Bent leave his own house for the couple that suddenly appeared in his life? But to Ben, it means nothing. It is just a house. He comes out near the shore afterwards to speak with Matthew. He asks him for a cigarette and starts telling him about the time he spent building this embankment. For a few seconds, he goes on and on about the effort he had to put in. He's just trying to make a conversation, but we see a sense of loathing that gradually builds up in Matthew's eyes as the old man continues speaking. Eventually, unexpectedly, Matthew punches him in the face. This is so sudden and abrupt that the old man stumbles on his feet. Immediately, Matthew comes back to his senses and apologizes, but the old man simply waves his hand at him, stands up slowly, and gets into his car to leave the couple alone. Now is the time to have the conversation that will determine the course of their future. Matthew enters the house and finds Helene sitting at the table. When he joins her, Helene tells him that she wants to lie down in the hut for a while, and leaves. Matthew looks at her from the window, and tears start building up in his eyes. He feels an unexplainable, immeasurable tide of love. In this moment, he is ready to give her everything and do anything she wishes. Nothing is more important than her well-being and their relationship. A short while later, he finds her sitting on a rock near the shore and embraces her firmly. He proposes that they stay here together. He will manage to do something about the work, and they can even rent a small house in the town. And if they receive a call about the donor in the future, they will decide what to do about it then. Matthew awaits a positive answer, a hug or a wholehearted, warm smile, but he doesn't receive any of it from Helene. This is not what she wants at all. Here, the poisonous thoughts that have been building up in Helene's mind explode and begin pouring out without a filter. She can hardly stand being with Matthew. In his presence, all she can think of is what they once were and what they've lost because of her stupid disease. She hates herself for that, for poisoning their relationship and ruining their bright future. And so, she doesn't want to live with him, she wants him to go back to France and start his life all over again, because that's what's going to happen anyway. This way, she won't have to loathe herself constantly, and Matthew won't have to live in this sorrow. Matthew cannot believe his ears. Once his turn comes, he starts revealing his feelings too. How can he resume living back in France while knowing that Helene is far away, living the rest of her days in solitude and fear of the unknown? No reasonable mind can think honestly that Matthew will be able to dine calmly with his friends and start new relationships, as if nothing has happened. In her last moments, Helene must be with her loved ones. With this, Matthew storms out and leaves her alone. He is sitting in the garage, smoking a cigarette, when Helene walks by. The storm of disagreement is gone in this moment, so she invites him to tag along. They're hiking together in the next scene, Matthew is begging Helene to slow down. But for some reason, the latter is racing some invisible entity. She's going as quickly as possible, not attending to her breathing at all, until her heart rate rises significantly, and she starts gasping for air. Matthew stops eventually and shouts at her in despair, but Helene stumbles and ends up on the ground. Matthew rushes to her then and does everything he can to help her out. When they get back to their hut, Helene is half-conscious and hardly has the energy to walk by herself. Matthew fetches the oxygen concentrator, and soon she is fast asleep. He watches her for a while, the love of his life who is going through the darkest of times. Matthew joins her in bed, and when Helene wakes up, she sees him sleeping. She realizes now how much she misses his warmth and his love. Expressing it has been a tough endeavor for such a long time, but Helene feels that this moment is different. And so, Matthew is woken up by her caresses and soothing hands as she brushes them against his body. After so much time, they share the love they crave. They eat at Ben's house for the last time, then pack up to leave. When they exit the house, a truck is already waiting to bring them into town. And as they drive away, we see a letter written and waiting for Bent on the dining table back in the house. They are dropped off near a ferry boat, and as the truck drives away, they embrace each other firmly. They start moving towards the boat, and for a moment we get the impression that they are about to get on it together. But the way they move soon tells us the contrary, this is a farewell. 
Saying goodbye takes a long time, and after what seems like an eternity, Helene watches Matthew as he moves away. 